So as a chief minister with some limited powers that I knew from the from the Paris Constitution, I seek for the resolution of the State Legislative Assembly. And that was quite normal from understanding a bit about the law. Now, when that suggestion was forwarded to the His Royal Highness, obviously the response that I would have more or less figured out was to entertain them from the limited knowledge of what I knew about the law and what I knew from the book. So when I was summoned on the 5th of February, with the frame of mind that I would have thought that my request would be consented, that His Royal Highness would have consented to my request, but it appeared to be that I was instructed to vacate the post. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it puts me in that situation that I could not <coughs> have access to any of my comrades, any of my leaders, any of my friends, who I could consult in terms of law, what would be my position at that time. The only thing that I did was I requested that at about 15 minutes Prior to the Royal Highness commanding me, requesting me to resign, I took that golden opportunity to explain to Tuan Ku. Because I could foresee at that time when Tuan Ku was telling me about the loss in the majority, I've lost confidence in the majority, that I could anticipate at that time that certainly I would be requested to leave or to vacate the post. Now, prior to the Royal Highness giving that instruction, I requested for at least 10 minutes to explain scenario. And ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, on that count, what actually was returned in the book that was presented to me, the Constitutional Monarchy, the Rule of Law and Good Governance, on page 48, I could vividly remember, as well as reading them prior to that, that I seek the consent to read that verbatim. And I say to Tuan Ku, apart from many other things that I've said, 11 items. One of the 11 items I say to Tuan Ku, under normal circumstances, it is always taken for granted that when the Prime Minister approaches the young Tuan Ago to seek the consent for the dissolution of the Parliament, that the young Tuan Ago would not withhold his consent. On that count, his role is only purely formal. And I utter those words in front of Tuan Ku. I have to see the difference in his, in his facial expression because I was saying it from a book that was actually authored by him that he could remember maybe those things. Ladies and gentlemen, after saying a few other things, then the statement came that you are commanded to vacate the post. That was a statement. Now, as a Malay Muslim, it would be difficult for me to resist. But I had this trust and responsibility to uphold the integrity, to uphold the trust that was given to me and my other friends in Pakatan Rakyat. That was the point I said in the most prominent of all the Malay phrases, Ampun Tuanku Beribu Ampun. But the Ampun Tuanku Beribu Ampun, Sembah Patik Mohon Di Ampun. Patik pohon sembah berharga. Now, those phrases has never come to my mind before. As a Malay, as a Muslim, you would never have seen those statements. You would never have read them. But it sparked in me at that point in respect of the, of the figure, in respect of the head of the ruler. And I knew at that time I was in front of Tuan Ku. I knew at that time that I was in the palace, and I used the palace language, which was later on spoken and taken out of context by Amno. Ladies and gentlemen, the impasse would have been settled at that evening or that, at that very afternoon at 1.32 had I conquered and acceded to Tuan Ku's request. That would look good on me as a Malay Muslim and I would not face all these consequences. But I told Tuan Ku in that language which means I back to the firm. And the funeral and impasse began. And the constitutional crisis began at that point. Now, when I took this case with all my council members and all my other advisors who came to, to assist me through the cases and uh, through the various phases of the court case, I realized that up to now, that what I have been uploading in the past, 
I would like to uphold the Indonesian constitution. I would like to see the rule of law being implemented in this state, in this country. But I realize that that is not happening. The various inconsistencies, the various hidden hands that have been influencing the decision made by the, like, by the various courts have decided and ingrained into me now that something needs to be done. So ladies and gentlemen, that is why now that we're looking for the rule of law to be put in its place. So much so that simple laws are being, being uh, rattled against it. For instance, when the impasse came, what happened on the 7th of May? When the speaker was being moved by force, right in front of the very eyes of the whole, of the whole nation, there was a point that we pointed out that if at all the illegitimate speaker now, Gunnison, is being chosen as a speaker. Now he was authorized to the Perak Constitution, let alone the other articles that we'll be discussing at various levels. Now under Article 36A, Bracket 5, as a speaker, he must resign from his posts and from his membership of my council within a period of three months. Now that was highlighted in the court, and it was not given any due consideration. That as at the 11th of August this year, and his final date within three months from the 7th of August, as at the 11th of August, his status as a member, as an active member of our council was still active. His status, Garrison, as an advocate and a solicitor, was still active. Now that was actually open and so obvious, not only to the man in the street, it was so obvious to the institution of the courts, as well as the palace. At least that should have been respected, but it was actually thrown just out. So that ingrained in me at the moment that something seriously needs to be addressed. You would have seen what happened on the 5th of November, when a date was given for, for me to seek an appeal from the court of, from the federal court. Now, prior to the submission by my counsel, we requested for a, a panel, a maximum panel judges. Because the argument was that this case was so serious. It's a landmark case because it's going to decide who the rightful military side is. At the same time, the consequence of it, it is also going to reflect in the decision of who should be the legitimate prime minister of the whole country. And the precedent is to be set. So on that count, I recommend it through my councils to request for a maximum paneling of the judges, 11, with the sound submission as well as rational behind. If there was a case, and there was a precedent before, involving drug trafficking, and the same court would put a list of panel of seven judges. Now we would have thought that this particular case it should be given due respect for much bigger number of judges. But sadly, that golden opportunity to clear the blemish as well as the negative image of the judiciary was not taken. I would have thought that this case would gain the confidence of the public that justice must not only be done and established, it must be seen to be established. So that golden opportunity, we thought that we could use the para fiasco, the para impasse, for them to take that and expose it so that we are now trying back to bring back the rule of law. Unfortunately, it was unanimously discussed and decided that the five judges, basically all are Malays, they did not reflect the Sato Malaysia. Whereas I was probably saying, that there were many other experts in the Federal Court on the Constitution which has never been heard, they've never heard about the Perra case before. We're not saying that the three judges who have heard about the Perra case to recuse themselves, no. We are saying that let alone the five, but please add another six to make it eleven. Even if you can't put in eleven, make it nine. Seem to be, seem to be fair, seem to be just. 
But ladies and gentlemen, sadly, it was, it was put aside and finally the whole case was heard in front of our judge.